So today our speaker is Karina Cho, who is a PhD student at, at Stony Brook, and her talk is titled An Infinite Family of Triangles. Hello, everyone. So as Ajmain said, my name is Karina, and I am a second year PhD student here at Stony Brook. So today I'll be talking about my favorite theorem, Poncelet's porism. So I won't be going through any sort of like detailed proofs today or anything. So hopefully we can just have this relaxing casual vibe. My goal for this talk is to provide some intuition for what is going on with this theorem and also tell you why this theorem is so important to me personally. So just to give you an idea of what's to come, um, I have an outline for what I plan to talk about. So I'll start by describing the setting for this theorem, and we'll talk a bit about the theorem statement. And then next, we'll focus on a special case involving triangles, and I'll introduce an application to non-Euclidean geometry. So we'll talk about some non-Euclidean geometry as well. And finally, I'll talk about why this theorem has stuck with me as a definitive favorite. And we'll look at some art that I made that was inspired by the porism. So let's go ahead and set the stage for this theorem. So here's the situation. Let's say we have two non-intersecting conic sections. So just for simplicity, I'll draw like two ellipses like that. And we can pick any point. Let's say we'll pick this point on the outside conic. And so you can see that there are two lines that are tangent to the inner conic starting from this point. There's like this line over here and also this line down there. So let's just pick one of them. Let's say we want to pick this line. So if we keep going, we're going to hit our ellipse again. And now there's going to be another tangent line that we can follow. So we can go ahead and trace that out. And so we can keep repeating this process, kind of just bouncing around from the outer ellipse to the inner ellipse and we keep bouncing around. And so something we can ask is, does this process ever stop or do we ever reach the points that we started with? Do we ever come back to that point? Um, so we might not, but on the other hand, it's, it's possible that we do return to that point. So, I drew a couple more examples with not just ellipses, but some other um, conic sections as well. So here's an example with like a parabola and ellipse. And so in these cases, I tried to draw ones that eventually do close up. So some questions that we might want to ask at this point is, when does this pink star-like thing close? Um, another question might be, how many times does um, the star bounce around? Is it always the same number? Um, and what happens if we chose a different starting point? So perhaps if we instead started at I don't know, like this point over here and bounced around. Um, are we still going to close? And if we do close, is it going to take the same amount of steps? So Poncelet's porism gives us kind of like a partial answer to some of these questions. So let's look at the theorem statement. So Here's Poncelet's porism, and it says that we have the following. So let C and D be conics in the plane. If there exists an n-gon, P, so P is like a polygon where 
we can also allow our polygon to look kind of star-like instead of the um, what we usually might think of a polygon as like this convex sort of thing. Um, so we have our polygon uh, with n sides, p, circumscribed by c, so c is the outer conic, and inscribed by d. Then, so if we do have this n-gon, then there exists an infinite family of n-gons circumscribed slash inscribed by c and d, respectively. And furthermore, every point of c is a vertex of one of these polygons in the family. And similarly, every point of D is a point of tangency um, to one of those polygons as well. So I guess what the porism is saying is that if we started instead at this point, um, since we do already have a polygon that is circumscribed by the outer conic and inscribed by the inner conic, then if we start at a different point and bounce around, we're also going to end up closing up and it's also going to take the same amount of steps. So I guess that's sort of an answer to this question and also this question how many times it bounces around is either it always bounces around n times or infinitely many times what we don't get is when our polygon actually is a polygon so when this thing closes up so that's just summarized here. So our takeaway is that we either always bounce n times. So in that case, we close, or otherwise we don't close. And we get similar behaviors at any starting point. Um, I guess another note is that we don't always, or we don't just have to start on the outer conic. We can also start on the inside, so say we wanted something to be, we wanted this to be a tangent line here. We could also start from the inner conic and do that sort of thing. Okay, so for just a bit of historical context, just because I think it's kind of interesting, the theorem was proved by Jean-Victor Poncelet, who was a French engineer by training, and he was also a lieutenant in Napoleon's army. And so what happened was he invaded Russia in like 1812, and the French got kind of wrecked in that one, and Poncelet actually was captured and was a prisoner of war for two years from 1812 to 1814. And while he was in jail in isolation, he was thinking about shapes, I guess. And so he proved this theorem while he was in jail. And then after he got out of jail, he published his paper about it. And I guess did some more math things after that as well. Um, anyway, yeah, it's kind of just, a fun little story. But so back to the porism. Something that's still kind of mysterious is that this theorem gives us kind of a description of an existence of an infinite family, but only if we have that one of these polygons already exists. And it doesn't really give us conditions on C and D for when this situation actually occurs. So we can learn a little bit more about this if we reduce to a special case. So for the rest of this talk, we'll mostly be just focusing on the special case when 
C and D are not just general conic sections, but specifically circles. And our polygon P is just going to be a triangle now. So this is the situation that we're in now. So when we have C and D being circles, we have this sort of um, picture that might be familiar. So now our outer circle C is the circumcircle of the triangle. So a triangle is just three points on the plane that are non-collinear. So those three points will determine a unique circle and that's the circumcircle. And then the incircle is the smaller circle that's inside of the triangle and it's tangent to the sides. And basically it's like the biggest triangle, you, or the biggest circle that you can fit inside of the triangle. So just for some notation, we'll call the radius of the circumcircle big R since it's the larger radius and the incircle radius little r. And also, so, the centers of our two circles may or may not coincide. So if our triangle happens to be equilateral, then those two circles will be concentric. So the distance between the centers will be zero. But in general, it's you're going to have some distance between those two centers. And we're going to call that distance little d. So. In this case, we actually know a criterion basically for when given these two circles C and D, when a triangle will kind of fit between them in this sort of way. So this is actually a result that we get from Euler. So one of his many theorems. Um, so this is the theorem that we're going to call Euler's theorem. Um, and it says that for a triangle, the relationship between the circumradius big R, in radius little r, and distance d between the circumcenter and incenter is given by this polynomial relation d squared equals big R times big R minus 2 little r. So it turns out that because of algebraic geometry reasons, if we're instead looking at a polygon with n sides with still circum circles and in circles, um, algebraic geometry tells us that the relationship between these three quantities is always going to be some polynomial. And um, I don't actually know any algebraic geometry. Um, so that's about all I know about it, but that's pretty interesting. I guess the formula um, gets kind of complicated as you go up, as you increase the n. So we'll just be focusing on this simple case when we're just looking at n equals three. So the neat thing about this is that we have a kind of tidier version of Poncelet's porism in this special case. So I'm just going to call it the infinite triangle family theorem, just because I think that that sounds cute. So it gives us this. So if we have circles C and D of radii big R and little r respectively, and without loss of generality, we can say that big R is greater than or equal to little r. And we let C or and we let little d be the distance between those two centers of the circles. Then Poncelet's porism in this case says there exists an infinite family of triangles T alpha circumscribed by C and inscribed by D if and only if we have this um, polynomial relationship between the three quantities. So this is kind of a neat result. And 
I drew this picture that I kind of like that kind of shows us a couple of these triangles in our infinite family. So here we've got our outer circle and our inner circle, and we can see well, lots of triangles that are circumscribed and inscribed by these circles. So Ponsley's porism basically tells us that because the relationship between these three quantities satisfies this equation, no matter what point of the outer inner circle that we're looking at, we can always draw a triangle starting at that point that fits between these two circles. So I like how it kind of looks like the triangle inside there is like spinning around. Um, and if you look on the internet, I'm sure you could find like GIFs of triangles doing just that. But unfortunately, I can't put GIFs inside of my OneNote file. But anyway, um, so I guess from this picture, it sort of looks like all the triangles are sort of similar looking. So maybe we could wonder, is there anything else in common with these triangles besides the fact that they share the same circumcircle and encircle? So let's look a bit closer at a couple of cases. So here's the case of the equilateral triangle. So basically, in this case, the distance between the two centers is zero. So if we look at this equation, and we have this side equal to zero, then that means that this side also has to equal zero. So basically, since the radius of the circle is never zero. That means this part has to be zero. So this just tells us that the circumradius is two times the in radius, which is just a kind of cute corollary of Euler's theorem. Um, but anyway, in this case, if we spin this triangle around, we're always going to get an equilateral triangle. So in this case, all of the T alpha in our family, they're all going to be equilateral. But it turns out that in general, the triangles aren't always going to be similar. So for this example, the orange triangle is obtuse, while the pink triangle, this long one, is acute. So in general, all of the triangles in the Poncelle family are all pretty different, actually. So that's kind of cool. All right, so now I want to talk a bit about an application to non-Euclidean geometry. And this also has to do with how I personally came across this theorem. So. In the summer of 2017, I was doing an REU at Oregon State University. So there's a picture of me in 2017 and my research partner, Jacob Naranjo, and our advisor, Professor Ren Guo. And so what we were doing during that REU was we were trying to generalize theorems from Euclidean space. So um, we are mostly just working with like uh, two dimensional things. So this is our R2. And we wanted to generalize theorems that we knew about things on flat spaces to spaces of constant curvature. So there are two types of curvature. There is positive curvature and negative curvature. So positive curvature things look like a sphere if it's constant positive curvature everywhere. And 
For negative curvature, it might look something like this. This is a hyperboloid, and um, the tractricoid is actually the one that has constant negative curvature. So the hyperboloid has negative curvature, but it kind of changes as you move around it. Um, but this uh, tractricoid, however you say that, is the constant ne negative curvature. And sometimes you also call this guy the pseudosphere. So you've got the sphere and the pseudosphere. Um, so let's talk a bit about what is curvature. So when I say curvature, I'm talking about something called Gaussian curvature. So before we talk about the curvature of a surface, I want to talk a bit about how we define maybe curvature of a curve at a point. So we're looking at this black curve and we maybe we want the curvature at this point on the curve. And so what we do is we look at the osculating circle at that point. So that's this pink circle. And what that is is basically just the circle that most closely approximates the curve at that point. So kind of think of taking a curve and then sticking a circle and trying to make it as big as you can until it like stops being a good approximator and then or like starts getting like off of the curve. Um, so the osculating circle at that point is going to have a radius r, and we say that the curvature at that point is 1 over r. So I thought a nice um, kind of intuitive way of thinking about how this might work is say you're like driving your car on like a really flat, open place, and you're driving along some sort of like racetrack and it's nice and curvy. Um, so as you're driving, you could at some point choose to just lock your hands into position and hold the steering wheel um, at a fixed angle. And then what's going to happen is your car is going to drive around in some big circle. And basically, that's going to be the oscill osculating circle to whatever curvy road that you were driving on. Um, and it'll be at the points where you started holding the steering wheel still. Um, and I guess the idea is as this circle gets big, the curvature is going to become flatter and flatter. So if you think about a really big circle and zoom into it, it looks pretty flat there. So that's why um, we want to take 1 over r to be the curvature. So it gets flatter as the circle gets bigger. And so now if we wanted to find the curvature of a surface, we could pick a point on our surface. So say we're picking this pink point, and we pick a direction to be our normal vector. So I picked up instead of down in this case. And we can look at all of the different curvatures of these curves going along the surface. And we'll give it an orientation. So we'll say that if the curve is like kind of facing away from the normal direction that we chose, then it'll be negative. So in this case, um, both of these curves have negative curvature. And if it's facing towards the normal, so in this case, this curve right here is facing towards it, so that'll be positive. So to figure out the curvature of that surface at that point, we pick the minimum and maximum going through that. So maybe in this case, are these two 
means if this one has curvature K1 and one has curvature K2, then we say that is K, which is just the product K1 times K2. So in this case, since these are both pointing kind of away from this normal that we chose, these are both negative. So K is the product of two negative numbers. So this is going to be positive curvature. And over here, if we had this curve having curvature K1, that would have positive curvature. And this curve, K2 being negative, then K in this case is negative, since we're doing a positive number times a negative number. And so it turns out that it doesn't actually matter which direction we choose our normal to be, since if we flipped it around, then we would end up getting K1 and K2 both positive, and overall K is still positive. And same thing in this case. So I guess the idea is that positively curved spaces look kind of like a bowl or like a sphere, and the hyperbolic or negatively curvatured spaces are, they look kind of like those, uh, what is the, the potato chips that are in the tube? I forget what they're, the Pringles, right, Pringles. So those are the Pringles. Okay, so let's talk a bit now about the geometry on these non-Euclidean spaces. So here we have a sphere. And so how do we define lines and angles and such on a sphere. So we don't have like straight lines anymore because our everything is curved everywhere. So our straight lines have become these great circles. So if we wanted to make a triangle, we would pick three points on our sphere and draw the three great circles that went through those points and then this pink thing is the triangle. And in order to measure angles, we could look at the tangent lines. So this curve has a tangent line there at that point and similarly for that one. And this gives us some sort of way to measure angles on the sphere. Um, and so we also have circles, which are just points on the sphere that are equally distant from some fixed point. Um, so our triangles on the sphere also will have circumcircles and incircles. Okay, so if you look at this triangle a bit, it looks like the angles are slightly like inflated at each side. And so it turns out that while on the plane, the angle sum of a triangle is always 180 degrees or pi in radians. And on a sphere, that angle sum is going to always be greater than pi. So the triangles will look sort of like um, this slightly rounded triangle. Um, Someone asked in the chat if there's any relationship between two triangles created by our lines in spherical space. Um, so are you referring to the fact that when you draw a triangle on a sphere, there's gonna be like the ghost of another triangle like in the back? Yeah, so it turns out that these triangles are actually the same. They're congruent. Um, and you can, I guess, something if you want to look up later, you can look up Girard's theorem. So that's Girard. So 
yeah, that's a great question. It's a interesting fact that you always have this kind of doppelganger when you're working on the sphere. Okay, so we talked about the sphere a bit. Now uh, let's talk about hyperbolic space. So there aren't as simple models for hyperbolic space because at least in the spherical case, we could just work directly like on a literal sphere. But in hyperbolic space, we have to be a little bit more tricky, I guess. So there is a bunch of different models of hyperbolic space. I guess the issue is that we have a hard time seeing things that are hyperbolic. So we try to put it on something that's flat, something that we understand. So here's one model that I'll talk about for a bit. It's called the Poincaré disk model. And this is a conformal model, which means that the angles that you draw on this uh, model are will actually look like the angles that they really are. Um, so in this case, our straight lines are these arcs that kind of go, um, they intersect the boundary of a disk, and they always intersect perpendicular. And you also have these uh, like diameters. Those are also considered straight lines. So in this case, when we draw a triangle, you get kind of a triangle that's like pinched on the sides. And so the angles end up being less than pi when you add them up. And you can also have circles in this model. Um, there's some sort of metric that you can put on this disk that will make it measure things like as if you were in a hyperbolic space. And then the circles are just points that are equidistant from that. Um, point using that metric. Um, so we also have a model called the Klein model, where you can just draw straight lines through your disk. But this is not a conformal model of hyperbolic space. But that's OK, because certain things are useful in different contexts. So in this case, our circles kind of get squished a little bit. but yeah, so this is kind of what a circle would look like in this model. OK, so to bring it back to some stuff we were talking about earlier. So in Euclidean space, we know that we have Euler's formula. So a question that I was thinking about, at least, was what about in spherical or hyperbolic space? So this is what one of the problems that I was trying to do in my REU. So we wanted to generalize this formula for these constant curvature situations. And um, yeah, this exact formula doesn't hold, say, on a sphere. So we're trying to find, is there an analog when we put some curvature in there? And so. What me and Jacob did was we started working first in the isosceles case. So if you pretend like our triangles are always isosceles, then that kind of like removes a degree of freedom. So it becomes easier to work with that. Um, and we were able to come up with the following. So this is Euler's formula, but kind of rearranged a little bit. If you like multiply it out, it will looks the same. And so these are the extensions to spherical and hyperbolic space. Um, so yeah, that's hyperbolic sine, the cinch, as some people call it. So if you've never seen an application for cinch, then <laughs> here's one. OK, but we were having a hard time generalizing to non-isosceles triangles. So what happens if you have just like a general triangle? Does the same formula hold? Or do we need to add some extra terms in there? Um, so this is actually where Ponsley's porism comes back into the picture. So 
it turns out that Ponsley's porism actually holds in spherical and hyperbolic space. So just for a quick idea of why this might be true, if we have a spherical triangle on the sphere with encircle and circumcent, uh, circumcircle, then we can do stereographic projection. So maybe we can pick the plane that's tangent to the in-center of the circle and project onto the tangent plane using stereographic projection. And the nice thing about stereographic projection is that these great circles, so the geodesics on the sphere, actually get mapped to straight lines under the projection. And similarly, it maps circles to circles. So if you pr project it onto the plane, you end up just getting the triangle just on a plane. And we know that Ponsley's porism holds in the plane. So we can apply it up here and then also project it back down to get, say, like, if you wanted another triangle, you could also just project that triangle back onto the sphere like that or something. It's kind of a bad picture. That's why I drew it beforehand. OK, so um, a similar thing holds for the hyperbolic space. It's a little bit um, harder to show, but you can just use the Klein model of hyperbolic space to see that one. So I will skip talking about the hyperbolic case, but it does hold, I guess, if you just trust me. So what does this have to do with our problem of if we have an isosceles triangle, how do we get to a general triangle? So a corollary of this is that if you have a triangle, so now our triangles can be either Euclidean, hyperbolic, or spherical, then you're always going to have an isosceles triangle, T prime, with the same circumcircle and incircle. And so just a quick like proof sketch of why this would be true is the following. So You've got your circumcircle and your incircle. And so if they're if your triangle is to start out with equilateral, then these two points are going to be the same points, but then your triangle is already, I mean, better than isosceles at that point. So assume that you have some distance between them. Then you can look at the line between those two centers, and it's going to intersect the circumcircle at some point. So I picked this top point up there. Um, it also intersects at the bottom. And so at this top point, then you can start here and do Poncelet's porism. So you can bounce around. And Poncelet's porism tells you that you return after three steps. And the resulting triangle that you get T prime is isosceles just by symmetry, by how we set up the problem. Um, so that's just kind of a quick little proof of that. So then what we get as a corollary of that is that the relationship between the circum radius, in radius, and distance between the two centers for a triangle is actually just the formula we found before for the isosceles um, triangles. So we can just take our um, like scalene triangle and move it to an isosceles triangle with the same circles, so to have the same big R, little r, and d. And then since that um, since this expression holds for the isosceles case, it should also hold for the unisosceles triangle. Okay, so yeah, so that was just a 
little application of Poncelet's Porism that I thought was kind of fun. And also it had to do with me personally. So that's like kind of cool. Okay, so for the last like 10 minutes or so of the talk, I wanted to talk about some art and also about some feelings because these things are all related, right? So basically so far, we've talked about, just to recap, Poncelet's Porism, how we can use the theorem to learn more about triangles in spherical and hyperbolic spaces. And so just to close the talk, I want to talk about why this theorem resonates with me so much on a personal level. Um, I feel like sometimes that as mathematicians, we can sort of get caught up in the technical aspects of our work, like the definitions, the theorems, the proofs, etc. And something that I don't see math people talking about very much is why they do what they do. So what drives us to do math when it's so difficult and frustrating sometimes. And how does the math that we do make us feel? And so for me, Poncelet's Porism is just a reminder of the why. So let's look at this drawing of a bunch of triangles. So during my REU, aside from doing like research stuff, we were also presented with an additional challenge, very important one, which was to design a t-shirt for the REU, just like y'all are doing for math club, I guess. So obviously this is very exciting. Um, and since I was spending most of my time doing research with Jacob, studying triangles, I had somehow came up with the idea to draw all of the REU students as their favorite triangle. So I had already picked out my favorite, which if you can't tell already is the hyperbolic triangle. So that's that's me as a happy little triangle. And so I basically just asked all of my new math friends to describe their favorite triangle to me. And I came up with this design that you see here. And I also have the actual shirt. Maybe you can't see the triangles on it very well, but you can see it better on the, the screen. But anyway, that shirt's become something of a like lucky math shirt. And sometimes I'll wear it during like exam days for good luck. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, because of this design, I had already been kind of thinking my, of myself as a triangle in a way. Um, so near the end of the REU program, Jacob and I had proven our generalization of Euler's formula for isosceles triangles, but we were like pretty stuck on getting it to the general case. And a few days before we're supposed to present our results, our advisor tells us about Poncelet's Porism. And this was actually the first time that I had heard it. And I remember the statement he gave us ended up looking something like this. So it was that every triangle has an infinite family of triangles that share the same in circle and circumcircle. And so he showed us the statement and then also drew a picture probably similar to this one. And I felt like everything kind of clicked for me at that moment. Um, because first of all, it gave us what we needed to complete our proof. So not only was this like incredibly satisfying, but it was also just reading the statement for the first time, it felt really comforting in a kind of strange way. And for me, it was that idea of an infinite family of triangles. I guess I realized that it seemed to sort of mirror the feelings and experiences that I was having in the REU. So I guess just for a bit of context, I had never really felt confident in my mathematical abilities. Um, in college, I was a pretty like run of the mill average math major, didn't really stand out. And I always thought that I was like way behind the rest of my peers 
who all seem like they're like way too smart and like on a different level than me. And like even when my application to the REU was accepted, I felt like I didn't deserve it and that I only got it because of luck. Um, and I was really insecure about it and insecure about my abilities to pursue math seriously. And even more than that, I never felt like I was a part of the mathematical community. But during the eight weeks I spent in Oregon for the RU, it felt like I actually belonged in that math community for the first time. Um, I got along really well with my research partner, Jacob. Uh, we're still good friends. And the professors and other students involved in the RU were also really cool. And I felt like we, we really were a little community. And so to bring it back to Ponce's porism, the fact that all the triangles exist in an infinite family felt kind of metaphorical in light of all of this. I guess the triangle was me and my infinite family was the math friends that I had made. And yeah, I realized that this sounds extremely cheesy and that's just how I was feeling at the time. And I think that that's okay. So the story is that the next semester after that summer, I was taking an intermediate drawing class, which basically means you get to draw whatever you want. and so even months later, I was still thinking about Ponsley's porzum. And so I wanted to make a drawing for that class that explained how I felt about it. So I did. Um, and I guess it's kind of a long wall scroll type of thing. So I guess I'll just zoom in a bit and just scroll through it so you can see. Okay, so this is just a long piece of paper that I wanted to draw on. It's about four feet long. And the people in the drawing are all ones who have encouraged me at some point in my mathematical journey over the years. Um, people that I felt were part of my mathematical family. And so at the bottom, it's just connected to words of encouragement that each of them have told me at some point that uh, really stuck out to me. And I guess they're kind of small, but uh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess here's a close up of the people in the drawing. So yeah, I guess these people all encouraged me and I just want to be able to pass along those good vibes. So I just want to say if that, that if you're one of those math majors who also struggles to feel like they belong in math for whatever reason, um, I just want to tell you that you're certainly not alone in feeling this way. And that even me as a PhD student, I still have a hard time feeling like I really should be doing math sometimes. Um, and so it's important, at least for me, to keep in mind why I do math. Um, and I guess Ponsley's porism just reminds me why I do math, because the people who do math are really cool. And it's like fun to do math with people and talk about math with people. So um, yeah, anyway, maybe it's a bit strange to talk about arts and my feelings in a math talk, but these topics are ones that I wish that people felt more co comfortable discussing in the math community. And I've been thinking lately about what it means for a mathematical contribution to be meaningful. Usually I think that like theorems and papers and books and that stuff are what we currently con consider as a community to be valuable. And I guess even though I've 
co-authored papers and done research and stuff. I feel like maybe one of the most meaningful math works that I've done is this drawing. And at least when I was applying to things like grad schools and fellowships and stuff, I included this picture that you see here on my applications, along with all my other publications and experiences, because I felt like my math inspired art is a part of who I am as a mathematician, just as much as all of those other things. And so I guess my hope for the future is that the mathematical community can be more welcoming and open to talking about the more personal and human side of math that at least I have learned to love. So that's everything I wanted to talk about today. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, Karina. That was an amazing, wonderful talk. Thanks for having me.